Have you ever asked for a sign from heaven? Chances are you received it. All right, before anyone unsubscribes because they think that I've gone all anti what I usually do and talk about on this channel, just give me a second. This idea of asking for a sign from heaven is archetypal. We all do it. We just do it in many ways and we might use different language. The closing of the eyes and that intense pressed thoughts, please let me know the right way to go is universal. Now, when we say please, to whom we're speaking, that's what varies. Some of us are closing our eyes and speaking to an invisible force that binds the universe together. Some of us are closing our eyes and asking a parental figure in heaven, however it is we understand heaven. Some are speaking with our partners, closest friends, confidants, spouses, bosses, who knows? But we're doing this. We're asking for help with intense need and closed eyes for revelation. And of course, this is the holiday of Revelation, Shavuot, that we're entering. But right away, we've got a problem. We've got an image that is so powerful and so problematic that it set us up to not have any idea how to listen for that answer when we ask for it. And by listening, I mean listening to that still small voice inside of us, listening to heaven, however it is we understand it, or even listening to others when we've asked advice. See, here's the thing. We've got, as part of the Shavuot texts, this narrative of what it took when we reached Sinai to be able to get Torah, to have Matan Torah, Kabbalat Torah, the receiving of Torah, the giving of Torah, the moment of revelation. And it is so dramatic. It is, all right, the Eternal says to Moses, be prepared because lots of stuff's going to happen. I'm going to appear to you in a cloud so that everyone will pay attention and you're going to wait three days. When three days happens, all this stuff's going to happen. There's going to be a shofar that sounds, if you've ever heard a shofar blown perfectly, you get how dramatic that is. And there's going to be all these things so that everyone pays attention. And here's where it all comes together. So we get the culmination of all this. We get all the signs and wonders in one verse, verse 16, chapter 19 of the book of Exodus. And I'm just feeling like chanting this today because it's just been too long since I've chanted Torah. Vayhi, vayom hashlishi, miyot aboker, vayhi, kolot uvrakim, ve'anan kaved al hahar, ve'kol shofar chazak meod, ve'echerad kol ha'am asher ba'machane. On the third day, as morning dawned, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain and a very loud blast last of the shofar and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Yeah, pretty cool, pretty awesome, pretty amazing. Great, perfect script for Hollywood. You've got the storyboarding going on right there. You know exactly what the CGI team has to do to make this version something that just looks really like what really happened. Except for if there ever was a literal moment of revelation guessing it's not what it looked like. In Midrashic tradition, we learn that Sinai, rather than being the most mighty and amazing of all mountains, was actually the most humble. That reflection of what Torah actually is, something quiet and humble. So why in the world did we end up with lightning and thunder and clouds and trumpets? Exactly as the Torah says, so that we'd pay attention. Except for that's not how revelation actually happens. That's the dramatic thing to catch us but it's not actually how we experience it. As the great spiritual teacher Carolyn May says, if God needs to get our attention with lightning and thunder, then that's not a sign that things are working right. It's a sign that things are working wrong. If the universe needs to shake us to get us to listen, it means we're just not paying attention. Now, this is my Shavuot video. I'm posting it along with my sermon for this week for Parshat Bamidbar. You don't usually get a, a double dip from me, but Shavuot begins Saturday night, and so I'm not going to be able to be doing computer work for a few days, and I wanted to get this out before Shavuot. And this is part of my iterative process videos. Iterative process means every single year we read the same things, perform the same mitzvot, do the same thing over and over again. Why? Because as we go through the religious calendar of Judaism, we keep on encountering the same things and the same questions that we need to ask. And the test is, 
do we answer them differently the next year? Are we actually elevating ourselves? In other words, instead of looking down and seeing a circle that just keeps on repeating, we turn the circle on its side and every year when we return to the same place and ask the same questions, we should have elevated ourselves and been part of the enabling of the elevation of others. And so every single holiday, and there's a whole row of these videos, you can go and click on the playlist, I'll link it down below and see all the other ones that I've done. Every single time we reach a holiday, we should have, quite frankly, every time we read a story in Torah, but I think the holidays are epitomizations. Every time we reach these, we should have several questions that we can ask and then see if the answer is different. Test ourselves. Are we elevating? Are we actually drawing nearer to ourselves, to those around us and that which is greater than us? If the answer is no, we're not participating in our own journeys. We are simply along for the ride as we flip through our Facebook feeds instead of actually attempting to heal ourselves, heal our families, heal the world around us. So what are the questions? What are these iterative, repeatable questions for Shavuot? <sighs> have to narrow it down. I think that there are so many, but there's two that I'll offer for at least this video. And the first one has to do with what we've already been talking about. And that's with the nature of revelation itself. Revelation isn't something just for that person far off. It's not only for the Moseses and the Buddhas and the great sacred leaders and prophets of various different world traditions. No, revelation's for all of us. Revelation is that moment where we can elevate ourselves and understand a deeper truth, and we all have access to it. And we all want access to it. We all want that deeper insight. We all want, when we're faced with a choice, to actually know which choice is the right one. And so we're all going to ask questions of others, of ourselves, of that which is higher than us in some way or another. And the iterative question of Shavuot is consciousness of what questions are we asking and what answers do we already know? See, here's the secret of our tradition. The book of Deuteronomy, we, we get the answer to all this. Lo b'shemayim hi. Torah is not in heaven. It's right here. We've got all that we need. And chances are, when you've last closed your eyes and says, please tell me the answer, we're asking that not because we don't know the answer. It's because we don't want to know the answer that we already know. When we see two decisions in front of us and they truly are equal and we truly don't know an answer, then it's gam the gam. Choose one, choose the other. Both of them are going to be equally good or equally bad or equal opportunities for us to be our best versions of ourselves in them. But those opportunities where there truly is no internal wisdom that we have, those truly equal moments, that's the exception, not the rule. If you're closing your eyes and saying, I don't know what I need to do, chances are you already have the lightning and thunder and the answer coming out of the cloud. You're asking the question because you already know the answer. You want revelation that you've already gotten, but it doesn't feel like revelation because it didn't come with the sound of a trumpet from heaven. There is no sound of the trumpet from heaven. That's a metaphor. Or do you think you should not commit murder was a brand new idea just because we didn't practice it? We still don't practice it, folks. It doesn't mean that we as a society don't know that it's wrong. Did we need a trumpet to tell us not to murder? Did we need a trumpet not to tell us to not mess with our closest relationships? Did we need a trumpet to tell us, you know, maybe we shouldn't steal from someone else? Did we need a trumpet to say our relationships with our family is important? Do we need a trumpet to tell us that we need to unplug on occasion or we're going to go absolutely nuts? Keep on going through all of the 10 utterances that appear on Sinai. Did we need a revelation or we just need to pay attention to that which we already know? Iterative question number one is, what answers do we already have? And are we aware as we're asking the questions that we don't need the trumpet? Which leads us to the second iterative question, and that is, what are we doing to prepare ourselves for revelation? What are we doing to prepare ourselves from the moment that we don't think that we've heard that answer yet, that we do close our eyes, that we do ask our closest friends and confidants, that we do ask the heavens, that which is greater than us, for some sort of insight? What are we doing to prepare ourselves for that? And again, that metaphor is a part of this entire story. We've got three days that passed between the wait, revelations coming conversation between the Eternal and Moses, and then when we get the clouds and the shofar and the lightning and thunder and the revelation actually happens. Well, there's a lot of discussion in Talmudic and Midrashic literature as to why three days. And if you really want to have fun with it, there's some great English translations or read it in Hebrew of the Pirkei de Rabbi Natan, which is a commentary on Pirkei Avot. And the early part of it deals exactly with this question. But 
the central metaphor is that you waited three days between the time you knew something was coming and the time that it actually came. What are we doing to prepare ourselves when the moment that we don't have the answer? And the first thing to explore is what are we doing to prepare ourselves for new information, for new insight? And here's the secret. If any of us already know everything, we've got no new insight that we're going to get. And I'm being slightly sarcastic, but we might give lip service generally to the idea that we don't know everything. But look through your Facebook feed, look through your Twitter feed, look through the things that you've posted. Does it sound like we're asking questions or does it sound like we just have a whole bunch of answers to give? If all we are is the answer giving machines and we're not actually asking the questions ourselves, and if it seems that that's all we're doing is giving answers, then maybe we've started to believe that part of ourselves. Let me look at it a different way. We have this idea of the Tikkun Lel Shavuot, the all night study session for Shavuot. One of my favorite things on the face of this planet, especially because it comes with stuff that I just absolutely can't eat, like cheesecake and that sort of thing, which I usually do anyway and get really, really sick. And we're not even going to talk about that. But this all night studying, why in the world would we do that? Well, the only reason I'm going to study all night, and there's a lot of reasons in tradition, I'm just taking it my own direction right now. The only reason we would study that intensely is if we start with the assumption we don't know everything, but yet we as a society today act as if we do. Otherwise, we'd actually be able to have conversations with people with whom we disagree. Why can't we? Well, oftentimes the disagreements are so profound that they're just loud and arguments and they don't have anything to do with the conversation. But second of all, we don't enter with the idea that we're going to have a conversation. We already know that the person, because they voted for that person, must be wrong. So therefore, they have nothing to offer us, even though they are a human being. And getting to know why they believe that way might actually be worthwhile. Meaning, are we entering into our conversations with curiosity? If we have no curiosity and we don't want to know something that makes us uncomfortable, we will never hear the new information and revelation becomes impossible. If there's no place in our hearts, in our minds for new information, then revelation will not come. If we're asking what's the right thing to do, but yet we are not making room in our hearts to hear something new, then it doesn't matter if a trumpet is blaring. We can't hear it. So the second question in a nutshell is, are we even aware that we've so closed ourselves from the possibility of revelation? What are we doing in order to allow ourselves to experience revelation? The timing of Shabbat this week is beautiful, Bamidbar, entering the wilderness. Look at the greater metaphor here. We leave slavery behind, however it is that we want to use that metaphor of slavery. And the goal is to enter the promised land, however it is that we understand that and what a beautiful metaphor. What happens in between? 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now, again, 40. 40 is a typological number, meaning a long time. How do we psychologically function as human beings? We enslave ourselves to thoughts, to persons, to places, to things to substances and eventually we hit rock bottom and we have to leave we have to escape we need the exodus we need to cross those narrow places and get out and we've got that place we want to go however we define it however that promised land seems to us a land flowing with milk and honey which Eretz Israel ain't that folks it's a metaphor and if we think the act of having enough courage to say I'm addicted to this person, place, or thing, all of a sudden means that the land flowing with milk and honey is right around the corner. That's exactly the problem because the reality is Bamidbar. We're going to be in a dry, awful, foreboding wilderness. As human beings, it's going to take us a while to get rid of the chafe, to get rid of the parts of us that can't even believe that new information is possible, that doesn't even believe we need it. We're fine exactly the way we are. We don't need to add any additional information. I know that the people with whom I already disagree have nothing to offer me. So therefore, and guess what? We're not going to reach Sinai. What are we doing to prepare ourselves for revelation? And the answer is already included in what I've already said. We enter in conversations with people who make us uncomfortable, with whom we disagree. I'm not talking about a discomfort that we need to run away from that person. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the discomfort of being exposed to ideas that are not part of our internal canon. At the most silly level, I'm talking about the person who has a disagreement with us on what the greatest of all Star Trek movies is and what the worst, well, actually that's not in disagreement. Everyone knows what the worst is. That's the absurd level. On the not absurd level, we're talking about the people who see a great issue differently than we do. We might never agree with them, but we will learn something by asking, 
why it is that they believe that. And if they don't want to engage in that conversation, then we don't continue with the conversation. But if we haven't entered in with even the slightest amount of curiosity that a human being sitting across from me has something as a human being to offer in the same way I as a human being with whom they disagree might have something to offer them, then we shouldn't expect anything from anyone else. And we certainly shouldn't expect that when we close our eyes and say, what do I do? That we're going to hear any answer, whether from a trumpet or from that still small voice or advice from someone who might have something to offer us. Shavuot is a terrifying holiday. The way it's portrayed in Torah is truly terrifying. We have the vision in Torah expanded in the Midrash that as the people came too close to the voice of God, their souls started leaving them. Hearing the truth was too much and they started dying. Being in the face of seeing who we are, how closed we are from anything other than what we already know is deadly terrifying to us, which is why every year we ask the same questions in an attempt to eventually reach that place where we're worthy of hearing something new. And that something new is always going to be something that we're slightly uncomfortable with now, which is why we haven't quite heard it yet. All right, that's it. That's our iterative process. Go and make yourself some amazing cheesecake or make a vegan version of it if you want to digest it slightly better. Study something that's going to make you really uncomfortable because on the other side of that, we might just find ourselves standing on those most humble of mountains hearing something that is life-changing, that answers a question that we've been asking for a long time and gives us the answer that we knew we should have answered a long time ago. Chag Sameach, everyone. We'll see you next time. Oh, hey,